On this episode of Athletic Training Chat, we have Adam Halpern, who is a serial entrepreneur in the athletic training realm. You may have come across Innovate AT in the past, and that's a lot of what we talk about in this episode is a lot of his history and how he got into the entrepreneurial setting uh, from working in the traditional setting and what led him to his current venture, Wave on Health, which is what we really focus on in this episode. Uh, We're looking forward to having Adam on future episodes, talking more about some of the different things with the mindset of being an entrepreneur, being a founder, CEO, and a lot of the things that come along with trying to run your own business. There are lots of ATs out there doing entrepreneurial things, uh, but I think it's such a unique world, especially within our profession, that someone who's done it and has a lot of that insight it's invaluable and to be honest with you personally is something that I wish I could jump in on I just for whatever reason can't go all in but I like hearing about it and trying to figure out ways to make it work for me as well and with that if you are interested in wave on health check them out it's some very unique solutions that they're proposing for the athletic training profession and something that could be really useful for our profession as we move into the future. I uh, just let them know that you contacted through Athletic Training Chat and we would appreciate that. And as always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. Check them out for all your sports medicine needs. Uh, turn of the year, uh, get a few things. I just saw they released their latest kit that folds up like a kind of carrying bag that you would for an office, but then folds out. You can attach it to a fence uh, to a wall and everything just kind of drops down and is completely organized so give that a look but without further ado please enjoy this episode episode of athletic training chat we are on with adam halpern who is an athletic trainer and strength and conditioning coach uh by credentials uh but has done a lot in the entrepreneurial realm of athletic training and that was ultimately a reason i wanted to talk with him i've been wanting to <laughs> chat with him for years i've been recommended from previous guests and other people i've talked to uh to connect with you uh jen Torillo out uh, out east and then uh rachel deal who Uh, You uh, obviously work with now, um, looking through the the website of the new company that we'll talk about. But before we get into all of that, I just wanted to turn it over to you, Adam, to kind of share your background, how you got to where you are, and then we'll jump into some of the questions uh, about the main topic today. Now, first, thanks for the opportunity. It's always fun to share the experience, share my journey with a greater purpose for the profession of athletic trainers and then individual athletic trainers. So I I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. If we start with like the journey of Adam, I'm from New Mexico. I grew up in a small town. I was always an athlete. And the story of most athletic trainers is, well, how'd you get an athletic training? I didn't even have an athletic trainer at our high school. It was too small. We had 43 students in my class. So total, you know, 170 kids in the whole school. It was like five towns put together, rode the bus an hour to and from, right? One of those small town stories, right? All all uphill in the snowstorm, right? All of our parents said. So I did not have an athletic trainer. I didn't even know what it was. And then I played golf, cross country, basketball track. I grew up in a ski town. So I grew up skiing. So I've just always been athletic. And I thought... In order to be a college athlete, you had to be amazing because that's all we see on TV. I won the state hurdles in the 110 when I was a senior. So I was a good athlete, but I didn't get any offers. So I did not go into college athletics. So when I was graduating, it wasn't my guidance counselor or my mom just found physical therapy or athletic training. And I was like, well, like strokes don't sound exciting. Car accidents don't sound exciting. Athletic training sounds like sports. That sounds more like me. I'll literally just go into athletic training that way. Then went to New Mexico State University because I'm from New Mexico. A really good program. Entered it, worked at a high school. 
as uh, a student athletic trainer right back then. It was an undergrad program. And then I worked at the college. And in the middle of college, I was like, you know what? I'm going to school with too many friends from high school. Adam is not stepping outside of his comfort zone. Like this is just now becoming kind of monotonous. And what can Adam do? So I cross-referenced the national exchange program with the national ATEP program. And I found five colleges and I wrote their athletic training program director an email or a letter. And I was like, hey, I'm looking to get outside of my New Mexico comfort zone. Would love to travel and be part of your program on the exchange program. Are you willing to accept me? I could only go for one semester and I was fortunate. I went to the University of New Hampshire. And as an athletic trainer, I worked with three sports that weren't even available in the state of New Mexico, ice hockey, lacrosse, and gymnastics. Like those aren't at colleges. There's club teams in the state, but nothing you could work as a clinical athletic trainer. So that really opened up my horizons. I then came back to New Mexico. I was the president of our student association. I was a lifeguard in college. So I had a good quote unquote resume. And then for grad school, I went to San Jose State, but I was fortunate because of that resume. I got a job at Stanford and I worked with national champions, Olympic athletes, future professional athletes, like during that experience, covered multiple sports from both water polos, uh, gymnastics, football, and then would cover all of the NCAA tournaments that were hosted by Stanford on a yearly basis, made some really good friends. And then because of that experience, I was able to work with the U.S. ski team after graduation. So kind of my first job in athletic training as a professional was I worked with the U.S. ski team and traveled all over Europe. And this was a long time ago. This was before the Torino Olympics. So I worked with the national team. I did not work with the Olympic team, but I worked with athletes that won gold medals in the Olympics, Bodie Miller, Ted Ligeti. And same thing, really exciting, uh, amazing experience. But that's when I really started to learn more about how my brain works and why it's different and why I'm not a true empathetic, compassionate athletic trainer on the clinical side. And I started to step into what we'll talk about moving forward with you, Joel. So that was ultimately the first question is kind of what drove you into entrepreneurship within the athletic training profession. And you kind of covered some of the origin story and alluded to it, but if you wouldn't mind sharing that, because was the first one, Innovate AT? Yeah, so uh, actually, no. The first entrepreneurial job was when I came back from the U.S. ski team and I came back home and then I moved to Albuquerque, right? The big city in the state. I was actually the traditional personal trainer, right? You get a job, you have a couple credentials, people sign up, they want to do get bigger, faster, stronger. They want to lose weight. They want to look sexy for the summer. But I went to a um, sport-specific training conference in Dallas, and this was like maybe 2007. And at that point, they were just talking about sport-specific training. And at that point, that wasn't really part of the gym model. So when I went to that conference, being an athletic trainer, understanding how specific the strength and conditioning department is in colleges, right, and with the U.S. ski team, I came back home and it was like, you know what needs to be built in Albuquerque is a very specific sports training facility. So that was my first stint in entrepreneurism. Like I had a partner, we had a bunch of personal trainers that worked there and things went well, things didn't go well, just like any, you know, kind of new company that you bring. And I didn't have that business background. I kind of had that subject, ma subject matter expertise and that vision, but that was really where it got started. And what I would describe to people was all we're really doing is bringing the Olympic training center to the masses. And the reason I said the Olympic training center, we were including strength and conditioning, which is like the personal trainer realm, but we were also including the athletic training perspective, which is this prevention all the way through recovery, managing injuries, really being an athlete's advocate that we were bringing it to the masses, but that's where it started and then to move forward, I then worked a couple jobs. One of them was managing 
the territory for a company called the Dental Cooperative, which is focused on preserving independent dentistry. My wife is a dentist, so I know how that world works. But it also made me realize the profession of athletic training is a very unique skill set. How can we bring the athletic trainer model to a more business to consumer model instead of just being an employee perspective? And then at the same time, I was actually the district's treasurer. So I was district seven's treasurer. So I was going around the country, joint committee meetings, right? I was going to our district meeting and just being an athletic trainer. I hear the same complaints that we all hear, right? We're undervalued. We don't get paid enough. Nobody sure. appreciates us. And I was like, you know, what needs to happen is athletic trainers need to put their foot forward and their money where their mouth is and stop just talking about complaining. Someone needs to do something. And I was like, well, you know what? That's me. So that's where I actually created Innovate AT, which was Innovate Athletic Training. Yep. And we made some good momentum. People appreciated it. But uh, And I'm not trying to be a naysayer. I'm not trying to be negative Nancy to the listeners. But athletic trainers love to complain, but they really don't like to do anything about it. So we had to make money as a business and we were trying to have athletic trainers pay us, but athletic trainers don't really want to spend any money. And yes, I understand we don't make a lot of money to spend, but if we don't invest in our future, nothing's going to happen. Sure. So I was having the same conversation around the value of athletic training. How can we bring this to the masses? How can we innovate the profession? But I was having that same conversation with CEOs of technology companies orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists, athletes, club directors, people in the sports and fitness world. It was the same message. Nothing was different. And they really started to gravitate towards it. So if you really get into being an entrepreneur and pivoting, the first pivot was having the athletic trainer as the customer is not a healthy business model. It's not going to scale. We're never going to generate the revenue to go anywhere. Let's go after the masses in the sports world, and then we can bring the athletic trainer service to them. So that was the first major pivot away from Innovate AT to where the, the name of Wave On Health came from. And as you make a pivot and you start to look at branding, it was like, God, what name is important to the end users? And it, then you have to get into the marketing perspective of, well, what type of name works in a domain and how many letters and what is already taken. And usually it's like a six letter word is what you want to have. And I came up with the name wave on, right. And I'll ask you, Joel, like if an athlete goes down on the field from a high school to an NFL game, what happens? They usually yell trainer first and then you get waved yeah. on by the official. As, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Athletic trainers are waved on to the field to support the athletes. So that's where I came up with the name. I just kind of a, a fun little fact, but there's also like two other uh, play on words that we've come up with. Number one, when any of us, right. Any of the listeners who are athletic trainers, when we refer our athletes to our specialist network, they are usually waved on past the front counter because the doctor knew they were coming, right? So it's kind of that white glove treatment. Yeah. And then the third, and this is kind of the altruistic vision with what we're building, we're literally the next wave of athletic health. And it's a, it's a service that does not exist unless you're an athlete in what I call institutional sports, high school, college, pro or Olympic level. So that's, there's a lot of play on words there, but that's how the that's the inception of the the new business, Wave on Health. So if you wouldn't mind as much as you can share, obviously, as this is all continuing to build and grow, what do you, what is Wave on Health and how does it change the game when it comes to you know going to the masses, as you mentioned, and potentially you know bringing athletic trainers to those people? Yeah. So once again, as a founder and a CEO. So I'm a first a founder. And as I describe, the definition of a founder is someone that found a problem and then created a solution. And then the CEO is someone that really looks at the business um, success and how do we generate revenue? How are we profitable? How are we 
maintaining KPIs, right? Key performance indicators. So I have to wear both hats, but I'll start with the founder because that's where I came from, which is the vision and that subject matter expertise. So where Wave On Health started was when you were an institutional athlete, right? High school, college pro, and you have an athletic trainer. I know I'm speaking to the choir when I say this to all your listeners, that athlete has an athlete health management system built around them every single day from prevention through recovery, right? And it's what we do. It's our value. We're really the athlete's advocate. We help them understand what to do now, what to do next. And then if they need a referral, we have that channel built out and they get to see the specialist as quickly as possible. That whole system gets athletes better, faster, improves outcomes, and ultimately decreases the cost of healthcare, right? That's what athletic training is really built on. If you step outside of institutional sports and you are an everyday athlete, you're a weekend warrior, a golfer, a skier, a triathlete, even a club athlete, right? It's all the same. They have the exact same problems as institutional sports. So now I'm kind of converting to that CEO mindset, Mm -hmm. right? So what I mean by they have the same problems is a concussion is a concussion. A shoulder is a shoulder. A knee is a knee, an ankle is a knee, right? Like they have the same problem, but their solution is where the the fork in the road occurs. All of our friends and our colleagues and our relationships and our communities, their solution is, well, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to hope it goes away. Well, that didn't work. Let me ask my friends and family what they did. That didn't work because it's my shoulder and they're giving me advice for their ankle. Like that was wrong. And then lastly, they say, well, I guess I better search Dr. Google looking for an answer. And when none of that works, which most of the time we as athletic trainers know it's not going to work, they are then forced into health care, which is really sick care because it's reactive, takes a lot of time, costs a lot of money. And then once they want to go back to their sport, they literally start that whole process over again. Hey, Dr. Google, how much should I run in the run outside to train for that 5k what should i do in the gym right because they don't have any resources so the inception of wave on health was well what if we bring this very valuable resource of athlete health management to the masses and then to create a scalable business model we leverage technology in a way that has never been done before And then we're leveraging the individual athletic trainers that instead of a one-to-one ratio of one athletic trainer per one athlete, one athletic trainer per one team, per one school, it can now be, well, one athletic trainer can manage 5,000 athletes. They can manage 10,000 athletes because we're leveraging technology in a different way. Everyone loves it. Everyone loves the problem we're trying to solve. They really see, see that we're building a scalable solution but the marketing costs associated with a business to consumer business model, when we're literally building a new industry, costs so much money. Everyone was like, yeah, we can't invest in that company. Like it's going to be $400 million like Uber with how you're going to market. So that was kind of the inception is like, there's a huge value of what we as athletic trainers do to go reach 24 million everyday athletes. That's what we've identified, but it costs a lot of money. So then we then took the discovery route and there's a different story of where we are today, but that's the inception. And same thing, you can ask me whatever questions and I'll be transparent, but we started with that everyday athlete. And then we realized that's not the best go-to-market strategy, the best go-to-market strategy. What's next? Who do we need to go find? So from a user's end, it sounds like if they, as this gets rolled out and, you know, cause not currently live and this is as of early November, still in process. Yes. No. So as of November, because we started with that direct to consumer model, yep. we've had people pay for the service. We've okay. had people um, use what I've called our prototype. Sure. And our prototype is really just leveraging existing technology that's already on the market 
But those are all single point solutions, whereas we're building a comprehensive um, platform gotcha. that it wasn't our true minimal viable product, which is the term in the startup world. Yep. And then it doesn't include all of the features that we're trying to offer, but we've had people pay for it. So if I, if I really jump ahead, we now have the appropriate product team to build out that prototype that we own, the proof of concept, and then ultimately the minimal viable product that we can build on. And th those are all journeys of a founder, of a CEO, of a startup. Where are we now? What do we need to do next? Let's go find people. And then how do we go to market and find what's called product market fit? So, And as a teaser to everybody, this discussion with Adam is very much about Wave On and everything happening there. And we are going to do follow-ups, not specific to Wave On, but all of those things he just mentioned, because I think it's invaluable to hear, A, not just from somebody who's been founder and CEO, but somebody within the profession uh, that is actually living this. So hopefully for anybody else looking to potentially go down that entrepreneurial route, um, it ties it in more to the profession. And so with the service, you have ATs that are on your, for lack of a better description, team, you know, part of WaveOn that are then being able to get connected. And I, as you said, using existing tools to basically help guide them through on a yep. kind of a fee, fee basis. Yeah, it's kind of a, we, we have a double-sided business model. We've had a double-sided business model. Um, it will always be a double-sided business model. And the reason I say that, one side is the athlete and the other side is the athletic trainer. But we're not truly just an Uber model where there's an athlete and then they find an athletic trainer. Because yeah. if that model exists, it is more so injury management. That's it. It's like, hey, I have an injury. How can you help me? Hey, I'm an athletic trainer. I know I can help. We're looking at that comprehensive athlete health management from prevention through recovery, which in my mind is the true value of athletic training, yeah. that we are the best advocate for athletes in all healthcare, in all disciplines. Everyone else focuses on one vertical, whereas athletic trainers are really there to have an answer for anything that's going on in any phase of being an athlete. And then one of their answers is, hey, I can get you to the best single point solution possible from a surgeon to a physical therapist, you name it, right? So the reason I bring that up is when we talk about the double-sided business model, it also means, well, what comes first, the athletes or the athletic trainers? I can talk with athletic trainers and within five minutes, they love it. They're like, this makes total sense. I've talked with NATA board members. They're like, Adam, it's amazing what you're building because this is what athletic trainers have been talking about for 30 years. And I'm like, that's great. I appreciate it. But that doesn't make it any easier. Right? Sure. <laughs> like, I can have a bunch of athletic trainers that like it. Going to market with a product is the difficulty behind what we're doing. And just as an analogy, I'm not referencing that I'm similar, but there was another idea that millions of people had for probably 10 to 20 years, which is, you know, what would be a great idea is if someone put a computer in my phone, in my cell phone, right? Think about how many people thought of that idea. Hey, I could then communicate with people when I'm not at my desktop. I could communicate right. with people when I'm on the road. It took Steve Jobs to really put his foot forward to do it. And I'm not saying I'm Steve Jobs, not by any means, but it's very, it's, supportive when I have athletic trainers tell me, oh, we've been thinking about this for 30 years. Yeah. Well, how come no one has done it? Excuse my language because it's freaking hard. Like that's why no one has done it. It's not easy. There's a lot of moving pieces and parts. It's easy to do an injury treatment service because that's kind of one nuance, or it's easy to say, I'm an athletic trainer in my town. Come and talk to me. I have a small little gym. Like that's that's an easier business model because it's getting to know people. What's difficult is building a scalable technology environment, especially when my background is like everyone on the phone. I'm the subject matter expert. I know how the service needs to be delivered. I'm not a technologist. I'm not a product guy. Right. So part of the reason we got this far is I'm an athlete, like most of the listeners. 
I just don't give up. I'm like, I know there's something here. I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm just going to keep on grinding forward until we find it. And that is where we are now. So when we talk about your question, if we have athletic trainers that are on the platform, if we don't have athletes for them to work with, they're like, well, what am I doing? Sure. And then if we have athletes and we don't have athletic trainers, if they do need support and we can't give it to them, they're going to say, well, this product, this service is invaluable. Like it doesn't do anything for me. So it's kind of, we have to kind of grow it at the same time. We need to have athletic trainers and we need to get organizations that those athletic trainers send, can support. And we're doing that. We're finding organizations that the athletic trainers already have relationships with and they realize a scalable virtual athletic training model is more cost-effective, captures more data uh, than just having to hire someone. And there's there's a lot of scalability with this model. And once again, I'm not trying to be vague, but I want to answer your questions appropriately. No, I appreciate it. And again, kind of knowing just where, learning more about where you're at, I, I mm -hmm. appreciate the candidness for as yeah. much as you, you possibly can as things are continuing to evolve and grow for you all. Yeah. Anything else about Wave on Health that I didn't ask you that you wanted to touch on? I feel like no, I, got I mean, I'll, yeah, I'm not trying to interrupt you. I apologize. If we sure. look at where we are now, I'm really going to put my athletic trainer hat on. And yes, it's an athletic trainer and then a founder. But now I'm really going to get into the athletic trainer who is a CEO. If we talk about athletic training and we all love it and we know how valuable it is, I'm really exhausted by athletic trainers just as i describe it screaming at the brick gymnasium wall we need to make more money we're undervalued we're underserviced but no one really has a solution right it's like the same conversation for 20 years as long as i've been an athletic trainer it hasn't changed yep. nobody has really done anything differently being an individual athletic trainer and owning a, a private clinic kudos to you that's fantastic yes we're going into industrial yes we're doing coverage models, but there's not this really innovative, how do we support the masses that are athletes in a way that's never been done before, right? That's what we're doing. So what Wave on Health is really looking at now is while we have that individual problem and a solution, it's not a scalable business model because it's going to take a lot of money to focus on onesie twosies from that marketing perspective. So then we talked with different marathons, different sporting events, different people in the sports world, and they all loved it, but they didn't have a financial problem. So then they said, well, we'll just push it out to our members. Same thing. We still need to have a bunch of money for campaigns through that curated list of athletes. Nothing was different. We still needed a huge marketing budget and I don't have that money. So then it was, okay, what is the big financial problem that is currently existing that we can provide a solution for? And that current problem, there's a $20 billion economic impact from sports injuries at high schools and colleges. And there's more athletes now than ever before. NIL, right? Name, image, likeness, the transfer portal. There are more athletes wanting to play sports because they think they can make money, even in high school, right? They can get a, a deal at Taco Bell, right? Anyone can make money. But because I'm talking to my peers, we all know the profession of athletic training is on the decline. And there's a huge impact for many reasons. Now it's a master's degree. So colleges can't get cheap labor. Athletic trainers want to have a quality of life. They feel overwhelmed. They feel burned out, right? It's all the stuff we hear. There are less athletic trainers going into high school, college, and, you know, professional sports than ever before, which is decreasing the management of athletic health. And one thing that nobody really addresses, if we look at athletic training, the business, the business of athletic training doesn't exist because we're just an expense on the budget at high schools, at colleges, even pro teams. And I know the solution is, hey, let's become a third party reimbursement provider so we can get paid from insurance. I get it, but that doesn't need to be the only solution. How can we come up with the revenue stream for our ultimate service? 
But because we're not a revenue generator, nobody looks at the business of athletic training. And what's a unique perspective that I've had over the last couple of months is like my wife was a dentist. We all know physical therapists. We know orthopedic surgeons. We all take our car to get an oil change. Every one of those businesses actually have a platform that manages the business. And yes, it manages the revenue and it manages the customers, but it also manages uh, the work output, the efficiency, the data collection. That does not exist in athletic training. The current platform is Joel's eyes and brain, Adam's eyes and then brain. And then we use a bunch of single point solutions to deliver the athletic training service. So if we look at the high school college market, a lot of what's going on is now individual athletic trainers are overworked. They're managing the football team to the golf team, to the tennis team. They're understaffed. And there's not a central hub that improves efficiency and data and data collection. So one of the things that we're really focusing on now is how do we improve the life of an athletic trainer through technology, through improving outcomes for the athletes, and then we can take that model and then bring it to the everyday athlete. So the athletic trainers that are already in those institutions, they would be a user of our system. And then the individual athletes would then have a tether to that athletic trainer that as they graduate and retire and they want to be a lifelong athlete, they're used to something that allows them to continue their lifelong athletic endeavors. And there's another company that did the similar model. My kids are uh, eight and 10 and they're given Chromebooks at school because as they become an adult, Google thinks that they'll use the Google uh, software, they'll buy Google hardware and they'll be a lifelong customer. So we're going at our business model in the same approach, but we're really taking athletic training into the 21st century, right? That's the biggest thing. We're transforming athletic training. We're not trying to change it. We're not trying to say anyone is doing anything wrong, but there's a lot of everyday athletes out there. And a lot of, I mean, one third of the high schools in the U S will never hire an athletic trainer, right? Like we all know that. And it's not because they don't value athletic training. Like they're not going to get an athletic trainer to move to their small town America for $25,000 a year. It's just never going to happen. It's never going to happen. As much as people value every school should have an athletic trainer, that's not realistic. We have the model of, well, every student athlete should have access to an athletic trainer. And that's that's what we're building. So there's, there's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of in the weeds. I'm not trying to be cryptic. Um, but we're doing something that really brings what we believe as athletic trainers, that everybody should be treated like a professional athlete of all ages and abilities. And mm -hmm. we're making it happen. I really like what you even said. And, you know, thinking about that, you know, those high school, even college, you know, those athletes that don't go on to the next level. And like you said, just become every day that, you know, you've established trust and ho hopefully trust and building that relationship with that athletic trainer to then give a platform for them to potentially connect back mm -hmm. in a formal way and for athletic trainers to value their time and not necessarily just give that away for free, which a lot of us do, you know, because mm -hmm. of the kindness of our hearts. But mm -hmm. if there was something set up for that, I really like that insightful idea. I, I just, I like how you worded that. And then I never really thought about the point um of what you said um about uh just one third are never going to be able to because nobody's ever going to move there then that's part of the problem too i we had a previous interview with uh someone who got uh through the Corey stringer institute's i think it might have been the innovate program that it was a combination a grant through like the nfl and like they applied for it to get an athletic trainer and then ultimately fund them but it's a smaller community in the south and they couldn't hire anybody like they did all the work to set it up everything was perfect there's support there and nobody wants to move yeah the only the only way they would get an athletic trainer is if that athletic trainer is from there and they wanted to go back home right like that's the only way it's gonna happen that's a hard yeah that's a hard thing to bet on <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i mean i, I just being from a, not a huge city but i'm from a city with a one a premier medical thing and they can't hire athletic trainers to cover high schools because people just either don't want to or they don't want the hours or 
you know, mm-hmm. you see where even in those, it's a 0.75 FTE. Well, unless that fits somebody's specific lifestyle, yep. because some their other, you know, their partner's making a bunch of money, but even then, then it might not even be worth it for them. You know, and again, depending on market and housing, you know, and all the fun things. But yeah, that's a, it. Hadn't really thought about that. That prop, that number of you know, every one has one there versus having the access in a way, even if it's not physically being there, um, where that could be hugely impactful. So one of the things, right? And once again, I'm kind of waffling between athletic trainer lens, founder lens, CEO sure. lens. Every customer discovery that I've had, and it's been over 10,000, which includes talking to athletic trainers who highlight their problems, which I've mentioned, at the end of the day, all people want is access to advice and support. That's it. Very simple. What is the best sports medicine discipline to give advice and support? Athletic training. Like literally, it's the best one. Because we're not going to say, oh, you need to have surgery. You have to come into the clinic for 12 sessions for therapy, right? It's just like, hey, this is what can work. And if it doesn't work, I'm available tomorrow morning to recap what happened. And if we look at, and I've said it, the complaints of athletic training and the big problem set around not making money, I've also told the profession I don't think it's our current jobs that are the problem of us not making enough money. I think it's the individual athletic trainer. And I'll kind of challenge the listeners. How often are you doing free work? How often are you taking those text messages, talking to people at football games, taking emails, talking to people in the grocery store or restaurants, because we're all compassionate, clinical providers. I get it. Like there's nothing wrong with us trying to help people, but most of our jobs pay us what they should pay us, but we're spending multiple hours per week just doing free work because we're nice and we're kind. If there was a model that would flip that and it was an easy monetization model and they didn't feel overwhelmed, right? That's what's happening in better help from mental health to weight loss, right? This is happening yep. in other industries. It just yep. doesn't exist in uh, in the athletic training space. And what we're doing is we're leveraging technology and people. I don't want to just have a technology company that takes the human perspective out of it. Sure. But I also don't want to be just a service company because that isn't scalable. If everything is a one-to-one ratio, there's a cap. So yep. we have to build out a business model that allows for what we've all known is super valuable to kind of scale. And then we then becomes the experts around athlete health management, which once again, I think is the true value of athletic training. Like we're the ultimate athletes advocate. And I just feel that's not discussed enough. It's not dry needling. It's not taking blood pressure or managing COVID. It's really like, no, we know what athletes need. And I don't, I I just, I don't know why no one really addresses it the way I put my, um, my foot forward and say, yeah, let's literally take it to the next level. I like it. I appreciate the insight. And again, the candor on all that. Yeah. Uh, the only other real question I had on this one, uh, which is going to kind of be a jump start for when we do a couple of these follow-ups is, you know, we're talking off recording just about the entrepreneurial mindset. And again, it's something that I always kind of like dabble in, but I'm very much like that side hustle ish kind of one where like if it starts going like then we'll consider maybe going all in on it but i'm not just i don't for whatever reason don't have the mindset to fully jump in but what would advice or guidance would you give to other ats that might want to look at this entrepreneurial path whether that is opening up their own gym you know or business as you had experience with or something beyond that as you are obviously currently experienced in with the things you've done. I will give a couple because there's not one simple answer. It's, yeah, well, however you want to frame it. Yeah. It's layered, there's chapters, but it's it's a good tease for whatever you and I do next, right? Because they can kind of branch off and have multiple additional webinars. And it'd be fun to do some of these with other entrepreneurs because everyone has their own unique perspective and experience. So to have kind of a, a, a fireside chat with multiple people will be cool. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, because there's athletic trainers listening, 
if the entrepreneurial business ownership kind of arm sounds interesting, if you're still in school, take classes. Like if you're on campus, go to the business school and take a class. Go to the marketing department and take a class. Don't feel you have to do it all uh, alone. There are resources, even though we're athletic training students or we're getting an athletic training degree, that's the value of college is, well, what else is here? I'm already paying for it. How can I get it for free? I wish I would have done that. I took like scuba diving and I got like personal personal things taken care of, but I didn't focus on the business. So that would be one thing I wish I would have done. It's not a regret. It just would have been cool. Yep. But as you advance in your career, there are free services all over the country from SCORE to different colleges, then have continue, uh, continuing education courses, find mentors, find advisors, right? Just to kind of continue that lifelong learning perspective. With that, understand there is no such thing as a unicorn, right? Like that's why it's a mythical creature. If anyone, including myself, realizes, okay, what am I good at? And what am I not so good at? And how do I fill out the Venn diagram with other strengths? It allows for ultimate success. So don't think you have to do it all. And with that kind of comes another perspective of as an entrepreneur, I would rather have a piece of something than a hundred percent of nothing. And that kind of goes into this concept. If you've never been in business, there's like this like mindset of, well, I got to own it all. I have to, I don't want to give anything up. There's really nothing that's a hundred percent, right? If you get married, you start to compromise. If you have kids, you compromise. If you work in a setting with another athletic trainer, you compromise. Nothing is really ever a hundred percent ownership. So if you go into business, just think about how can I have a piece of something that's much bigger than me and then find partners, find advisors, right? Get other people involved. Don't think you have to do it all by yourself. And then probably the biggest piece of advice, is, and this is kind of like the personal story, which leads to however you can mold it for yourself. I'm fortunate that I married my wife, who was a very successful dentist, and the compromise was, I'm going to be daddy daycare Uber driver. Like that was my first full-time job. And then my part-time job was I'm a founder CEO. So she gave me the flexibility and the freedom to build a startup where I didn't have to have a job that was an eight to five, right? I traveled around the country being an athletic trainer and I couldn't work on it. So somehow figure out how your personal and work-life balance can allow you to be an entrepreneur and only be an entrepreneur, only own something if you have it in you. And the only person that can answer that is you. And like, Joel, you're kind of hitting on it. It's like, well, I don't know if I want to do that. Then don't do it. Like, there's nothing wrong with not doing it. Maybe you could have a side hustle. You still have that monthly like income mark. So there's no risk, right? You have a little bit of side money that you can kind of play with a little bit of side time. But if someone does not have that real risk tolerance, do not be an entrepreneur. Because this is many years I've been doing it. And I don't have imposter syndrome. Like that's the big thing that comes up when you own business. Like, oh, I don't think I can do it. I have the opposite, which is like, am I the right person to do it? Uh, every time I send out an email, even this happened over the week, I did a, a new kind of updated one minute explanation. All the feedback back to me was what they would have done differently, why they felt it was wrong. And they started with, hey, we like it, but you have to have thick skin. So only be an entrepreneur, only be the leader of something that is new and innovative if you truly have it in you. Or be a team member of someone that has that skill set. So I'm also not saying don't get into startups or don't get into entrepreneurism. Just understand where your personal strengths align with your professional strengths. And then when you hit that sweet spot, it's like, oh, this is this is fun. This is exciting. Love it. I appreciate the the insight and the recommendations on that one. Yeah, of course. If you don't have anything else to cover um, that we didn't get to. Ready for the AT chat questions? No, I mean, if I get into the podcast, 
what we are looking for to transform the profession of athletic training, because once again, I'm going to go back to where we all came from, are two things. Universities, colleges, and high schools that are looking to improve their athletic training services, which means they have an existing staff that feels overwhelmed. How can we support them? Or they know school XYZ doesn't have an athletic trainer and they can't find one. So we're looking for introductions. And it, and I'll say this to the audience. I don't go in as a hard sales man. I go in as, hey, what are your problems? We might have a solution. Would love just to explain what we're doing. It might be a good fit. Tell us what we're doing wrong. But more importantly, how we can build out this service to match your problems, right? Your pain points. So if anyone on the call is or on the podcast is interested in learning more, reach out to me and I'll give my contact information in a little bit. Or if you know that athletic director or that coach, that would be a great person just to connect with informally. I would love to talk to them. And then third or second, as a startup, it is about how do you have the right resources to grow and scale? I wish I had a huge bank account that I had a big exit before and I have all this money to play with. I don't. So we're looking for investors. And I've always known the best early stage investors are people that understand the problem that we're trying to solve. And that problem is not a digital healthcare company that's getting third-party reimbursement. The problem we're solving is people that have been in college athletics or high school athletics, and they know the value that this world of athletic training has helped them in. So the best early stage investors are going to be professional athletes or successful athletic trainers, orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists have that have been part of this ecosystem, right? And once again, it's not athletic trainers are God. It's not that athletic trainers can do everything. We're part of the ecosystem. So it's bringing those right type of early investors to us. And we'll just, I'll just use basketball because it's kind of basketball season. There's a lot of NBA players that have their own little venture fund or they have their own little investment group and they have their financial planner. This is a way for them to support 20 million basketball players across the country, right? Like this is them to leave a legacy. Or if it's an orthopedic surgeon, this is a way for them to get the general public to be referred to them the same way the athletic trainers refer high school athletes or college athletes. So it's just, it's finding those early stage investors. So early right. adopters and then early stage investors is how the group can help us grow. And then you, the athletic trainer would be part of that, that growth and that delivery model. And then if anyone has questions, I'll, I'll give my contact information a little bit later. Sounds good. Uh, so first question, and yeah. very interested to hear your answer on this because we've kind of yeah. talked about it the whole podcast, but where do you see athletic training going in the next five to 10 years? Um, if athletic training does not change, we're going to be paper pushers in the occupational setting. We're not going to be athletic trainers. We're just going to be moving people around occupational problems. And then when they have musculoskeletal, because it's now becoming like a work comp, they'll be pushed to physical therapists. I don't think we'll be managing uh, the occupational setting, the way we manage athletes. Great. If we don't figure out how to change traditional sports, a lot of high schools that don't have the funding for an athletic trainer realize it's once every five years we have a C-spine. Like, yes, it's nice to have athletic trainers on the sideline. Like, it's nice. It's valuable. But it's not necessary. What happened to DeMar Hamlin was unfortunate. It's not a medical emergency. We're not going to have athletic trainers in every high school now. The government is not going to spend $20 billion to put an athletic trainer in every high school. It's not going to happen. Tax dollars already pay for EMTs. Like it's already built into the economic model. It's already built into state and local governments that if we don't figure out how athletic training becomes a scalable model, there's huge risk of it just kind of fading into the distance and there's individual athletic trainers that bring a lot of value. I still think we'll be in pro sports. However, if you look at what's happening, right, there's 
uh, sports science is kind of taking over the eight, the PT ATC model is taking over the traditional athletic trainer. And I, I just feel there's too much of an emphasis on specific skills, specific settings, instead of what do we bring that no one else brings? And I've said it, athlete advocacy, right? Like we're the ones that know it all. Doesn't mean we know how to do it all. And it doesn't mean we're the expert in it all. Um, and, you know, with that, I'll kind of say this as kind of a, a last statement about Wave on Health. Technically, when we're doing everything in a digital environment, we're not really doing athletic training because athletic training defined by the American Medical Association is when you are standing on the sidelines, when you are um, seeing them in the athletic training room, we're not. And we want to be respectful to the historical perspective. And we all know the term athletic training, everybody wants the name changed. But at the end of the day, nobody cares about athletic training except athletic trainers. Like no one else cares. David Gallegos, who was the District 7 uh, district director, and he's been on our board for many years, he said it best. Nobody cares that I'm an athletic trainer. They just care that David makes me feel better, right? And if we as athletic trainers take that perspective, that's really valuable. But if we look at a branding and a marketing scalability model, which I have to do as an athletic training, as, as a CEO of an athletic training company, there is a term out there that is very familiar in the business climate. And that term is agent, insurance agent, real estate agent, financial planner. Obviously it's different, but you get the perspective. And the goal of the agent is to help the customer get whatever they want. I wanna have whatever insurance plan. Okay, I'll find you an insurance plan. I wanna get a house, I wanna get a condo, I wanna get a, a farm. Well, that real estate agent accomplishes the goal. So internally, as we scale, the athletic trainer service is going to be the foundation, but then we're actually calling them wave on agents because that's what's important to the end user. And it's not to disrespect athletic training. It's more so what we actually can't use athletic training because we're not doing it in the same fashion. But that's that like next level transformation of what we've all learned to do in a one-to-one -one ratio how do we build and create and credential wave on agents? That's kind of the, the roadmap we're on. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. What advice would you go back and give yourself as a young athletic trainer? Um, you know, take more business classes early on. Um, find the right people early on to bring my vision to life. And it wasn't that I was trying to do it all. I just didn't know what I didn't know. Sure. So I, I say this all the time. It's like, I don't know what I don't know. So I don't even know what questions to ask because I haven't been there. Mm -hmm. So somehow figure out what I don't know faster. And then I would be able to ask the right questions. But I do know if I was taking more of a business curriculum or entrepreneur uh, studies or finance, it just would have helped because we all know the athletic training curriculum. It's all clinical. It has nothing to do with business. Right. I, yes. I've learned that lesson as well. Yeah. What has been the most influential resource you found in your career? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's obviously the people that believe what we believe, right? That everyone, all ages and abilities should be treated like a professional athlete. And once you find the people that like, oh my God, this is amazing. I love your concept. Then they kind of open up their uh, mental file cabinet and then they open up Rolodexes and they open up uh, introductions. So the most valuable resource is being open-minded, like not thinking you know it all, right? Don't try to be a unicorn and then things will start to open up. So it I actually have to give you two. Yep. It's um, being open-minded, but also being patient. Like those are the two things. It's not going to happen overnight. We all want to win a world championship right away. How many teams win it the next year, right? It takes five years. Once they get new coaches, they get a new quarterback, they get a new point guard, whatever the case may be. So open-mindedness and being patient are the two most valuable resources. As an AT in your role, how do you take care of yourself? Um, I mean, I, I will say this, I'm not perfect. Am I messed up? Yes. Did I literally kind of get off? 
I'll, I'll say a therapy session an hour before this. Yes. <laughs> but because I'm like most listeners, most of us got into athletic training because we were athletes and we love it and we want to help out. So I work out every morning at 5.30. We ski as a family. Um, we go camping. Do I need to do more? Yes. Uh, part of my actual self-discovery is I need to get outside of the the R&D lab, which is just my home because it's a remote working environment now. We don't have a headquarters. My team is all over the country, but that does create isolation. It does create loneliness. So I need to get outside and be involved in other activities. So I'm going to start supporting like the local adaptive ski program, just okay. because like that's kind of our world and I'll meet new people and I'll be able to have conversations outside of what I do. What is my business? Come on team, let's get going. So you have to focus on yourself. You have to focus on health and wellness. I eat well, I don't drink, I don't smoke. So all of that is how I take care of myself, but I'm still messed up, right? <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all messed up to some extent. That's, no one's perfect. <laughs> that, that is fair. So. If you could change or eliminate one thing, it could be a modality, a common practice or a mindset in the profession of athletic training, what would it be? And I know I've kind of touched on this, but yeah, I mean, I've touched on it. I think there's two things. One, stop complaining, be part of the, the solution, right? That's kind of to the profession of athletic training. But there is also a lot of God complex in athletic training. I can't believe they went to that physical therapist when I can do that. I can't believe that they went to go get a second opinion from an orthopedic surgeon. Well, they're an orthopedic surgeon. Like, stop being God. Stop thinking you know it all. Like just realize we are part of the wheel. We're a valuable resource. Stop take, taking things personally and realize that we're part of a greater cause and know our true value. So th that would be what I take out. Stop bitching and moaning, right? Excuse my language. I know it's a podcast. You're all good. Be part, be part of the solution, but also stop thinking we can do it all. How can we be that athlete health navigator? How can we be that athlete advocate Instead of, I can't believe they went somewhere else. It's like, well, if you would have navigated them there, you would look like the rock star, right? Like there's a lot of ways to go. That's true. Yeah. Final question is what does being an athletic trainer mean to you? Um, Being an athletic trainer to me means having the most in-depth knowledge about what it means to be a healthy athlete and how to get better faster and having all the resources to get back into the game as fast as possible. I like it. Succinct. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And that was on the fly. I've never thought of that answer before. I just there came up with <laughs> some of the best things just like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You had mentioned earlier and obviously we'll link all this up. If people wanted to connect with you either a, cause of interest in it or B, as you mentioned, all the potential connections and just, kind of helping spread the word or, you know, making that connection, being part of that wheel, uh, as you just said, what would be the best place for them to do so? Yeah, the best place is obviously email adam at waveonhealth.com. So wave on is two words with health on the back of it. So it's three words.com. Yep. But you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Everyone can be more active, but those are the two places, right? And then if you reach out, I'll give you my cell phone, but I don't need to give out my cell phone now. So email adam at waveonhealth.com or just look for Adam P. Halpern, Wave on Health on LinkedIn. Those are just the two best places. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to explain, you know, kind of what Wave on Health is and everything that led up to it. Um, and definitely looking forward to digging into more of the different things that we talked about, but in a lot more depth in some follow-up episodes. So thank you again for taking the time. No, you're welcome. Like I said, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm looking forward to what we do next and even offline conversation with you. Let's make awesome. it happen. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for checking out this episode of Athletic Training Chat. We hope you got something out of this. Um, not only just to hear about Wave on Health, but to really focus on that entrepreneurial side of athletic training maybe jump started some ideas for you and gets you out there uh starting an idea that you have again if you're interested in wave on health check them out they ask where you heard about them please let them know it's from the podcast we appreciate that greatly i again think there's a lot more that can 
benefited from this idea as it keeps coming to fruition for them. Thank you again, Mueller Sports Medicine, for sponsoring the podcast. Always appreciative of them. And this episode brought to you by the Athletic Training Daily Journal. If you're interested in journaling or you want to use it for your administration class or just get it for your staff to help with some reflection, empowerment, and get thinking about some of the different aspects of athletic training, check it out at clinicallypress.org in the shop where you can get a 14-day free sample or look at it on amazon.com to search for the Athletic Training Daily Journal. I think we're like the fifth or sixth on there right now, but if you check it out, hopefully that bumps up the way a little bit. But thank you, as always, for listening, and we will catch you next time.